Good evening, and welcome to another edition of Arroyo Live. I'm Joe Carbonetta. Our program is produced by Pasadena Media to help enrich the community through informative and meaningful conversation. Remember, you can share your questions or comments with us anytime at arroyolive at pasadenamedia.org. In November of 2020, then City Council Member Victor Gordo became Pasadena, California's third citywide elected mayor. The culmination of a career in local politics, which began in 1997, the road to becoming the city's top elected official started quite humbly, making daily deliveries for one of the city's local newspapers. An almost lifelong Pasadena resident and eldest son of hardworking Mexican immigrants, Mayor Gordo was educated in Pasadena's public school system, played ball in the district's high school athletics program, and worked his way through law school, passing California's bar exam in a single attempt. Also in 2020, Pasadena appointed a new vice mayor, Andy Wilson. A Pasadena resident himself of more than 20 years, Vice Mayor Wilson holds an engineering degree from Dartmouth College and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Tonight, we'll talk with both of these distinguished city leaders. Please join me for Arroyo Live. I'm joined by Pasadena's mayor, Mayor Victor Gordo. Mayor Gordo, thank you for joining us this afternoon, and how are you today? I'm doing well, Joe. Thanks for having me. It's a beautiful Pasadena day, and I'm, I'm happy to be with you and your viewing audience. It's truly a pleasure to be speaking with you, and again, we thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Mayor Gordo, it, uh, you, you, yours is, a, is an interesting story as for your political uh, origins, and I'm wondering if you'd take a moment to tell our viewers at home a little bit about uh, how you got to be the mayor of Pasadena and, and all that came before. <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm a, a resident of Pasadena since age five. Uh, I was born in Zacatecas, Mexico. Uh, my parents brought me to Pasadena at age five. Uh, and, you know, a number of people have asked me, how does a immigrant Spanish speaking, uh, monolingual Spanish speaking uh, kid uh, become involved in, in local politics and ultimately become mayor? And, you know, in, in, in large part, it's because I grew up in Pasadena, played in the parks, got to know people, uh, and fell in love with the city uh, and the people of the city. Uh, one of one of the things that um, I credit with my interest in local affairs is having delivered the Pasadena Star News, um, and it was one of my first jobs. And you know what I learned as a paper boy is. Uh, riding my bike through the city's neighborhoods. It's, it's a beautiful place, but also every day as a paper boy, you fold a newspaper and put a, a rubber band on it uh, before you deliver it at five in the morning every day. And you know, pretty soon you're reading the front page and you're reading about someone who they call a city manager, um, members of the city council, uh, a mayor, a police chief and a fire chief. And I, I became very interested uh, from age nine uh, through high school, uh, reading the Star News and uh, following civic affairs, ultimately uh, found my way to become involved in the community uh, and then uh, ran for office. Um, first as a member of the city council, served uh, for nearly 20 years. And then uh, I, I uh, ran for mayor, as you know, this past year. and was fortunate enough to gain the trust of the people of Pasadena. And uh, here I am in the beautiful mayor's office, um, learning a great deal and trying to do all that I can to, to improve our city. Well, certainly the direction that Pasadena or any city for that matter takes uh, is, is more than, than one person. Um, you know, as mayor, you make a lot of, of the decisions for the city, but, but there are certainly large groups that are involved in it. But obviously, you, you bring with you to the position some type of a vision. What is your vision for Pasadena? You know, I, my, my role as mayor is to bring people together. Uh, my role as mayor is to ensure that uh, different voices in the community are heard, uh, that perspectives um, from every part of our city are understood, uh, and that the city council is... Um, is working as a team 
to achieve the goals of the city, um, to, you know, to ensure that uh, the staff um, that works for the city manager, for the city clerk, and for the city attorney are every day uh, working for the benefit of the residents of the city. And, uh, you know, I, I would like to, I would like my vision for Pasadena is that 20, 30 years from now, we look back uh, and see that this generation of Pasadenans uh, contributed greatly to uh, the betterment of Pasadena, that uh, we left the city uh, better than we found it, um, and that people from all walks of life have an opportunity to not only live in Pasadena, but prosper in Pasadena. Uh, and I think by working together, we can achieve that. Uh, and, you know, we've been thrown a few curveballs uh, in the last 14 months with the world pandemic and, you know, impacts to the economy um, and, and certainly uh, uh, police uh, and, and uh, public safety issues. Uh, but, you know, we I, I think we're in a better place now uh, and are beginning to get a handle um, and is beginning to address the issues that uh, that have come before us. Once we uh, once we are on a path to address the the uh, curveballs that have been thrown at us, uh, then we can uh, begin the work of of uh, improving our city in other ways, budgetarily, uh, address the issue of housing, address address the issue of our infrastructure, uh, and achieve the goal goals of improving our city. Well, you took over the office of mayor in November of 2020, which was squarely in the middle of the pandemic and perhaps during one of the darker periods of the pandemic, at least for us here in the state of California. What was that like for you? No, well, it, it, it continues to be a challenge. It was and uh, is, a, is a challenge. You know, I've, uh, you remember the old uh, saying, be careful what you ask for in life because you may just get it. Uh, <laughs> you know, I say that in jest, uh, but uh, yeah, you know, I, I had the, uh, the I, and I would say uh, the benefit of taking over um, at a time when the city was in crisis, when uh, there was the need for a, the mayor and the city council to be very directly, uh, more so than ever, involved in, in civic affairs. And I, I, you know, I, um, I feel prepared uh, and I feel fortunate to have the opportunity to serve in this great time of need. Um, and uh, I feel well equipped to do the job. Um, and I've also benefited greatly from a group of colleagues on the city council who uh, have shown a willingness to serve together and work together uh, and um, support the efforts that uh, we know will help to get the city through this difficult time. Uh, and so, you know, no one person can do it alone. Uh, and I'm proud to serve uh, with my colleagues on the city council as we look to move the city forward from this very, very difficult time. Uh, but I feel privileged to be sitting where I'm sitting, uh, particularly in this time of crisis. You mentioned that you feel prepared. Um, and certainly there are a lot of, of experiences that go into preparation for anything, but is there anything in, in your background that you think prepared you best for the crisis at hand and all that has followed? Yeah, I think a, a willingness to uh, listen, a uh, willingness to be compassionate, um, I think work ethic, um, and, and certainly my personal life's experience. Uh, you know, I, you know, we all bring to any job uh, our personal life's experience. And, uh, you know, I've, I've had the good fortune of uh, having grown up in, in very difficult circumstances. Um, you know, first uh, living in, in Zacatecas, Mexico, as my parents were trying to establish them here, uh, was very difficult and traumatizing uh, for, you know, a three-year-old to have to remain uh, as his parents moved elsewhere. But then joining my parents here at age five, and you know, we lived in the garage. My father and mother both were minimum wage earners. Uh, my father worked at the same restaurant for 50 years and you know, not speaking the language was also very challenging. And so I think my life's experiences uh, facing adversity, facing difficult circumstances, circumstances, having to work with others 
um, in order to improve conditions, not just for myself, but for my family, uh, has prepared me to face difficult challenges now as, uh, as mayor of Pasadena and, and uh, help to um, provide whatever guidance I can to my colleagues on, on the city council. And I also wouldn't uh, discount the fact that I've had the benefit of working with many members of the city council uh, in the 20 years as a council member that I, that I had the privilege to serve uh, the residents of District 5. Well, having lived in Pasadena, uh, beginning at the age of five, you, you've obviously seen the city uh, in all aspects, but how has the city changed over the years? You know, the, the, the city, the city has, I would say to you, improved in so many ways over the years. You know, Pasadena is, is a city um, that is, is a, uh, that has a very strong sense of place. Um, and I think that's what makes us very special. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, if, if you look at the history of our city, uh, it's evolved over generations. You know, it's been generations of Pasadenans that have built a great city. Uh, our job today is to protect um, the city, uh, all, all of the wonderful things, you know, the beautiful architecture, the neighborhoods, uh, some of the great assets that we've inherited. Uh, but also improve the city and make sure that everyone is prospering and sees an opportunity to prosper. Um, I've seen old Pasadena change. I, I recall the mall um, uh, in the city of Pasadena that's now Paseo, Colorado. Um, I, I just, I've seen the city also change in some ways that maybe people are not happy with uh, and that we need to address. Uh, and so part of the task is to preserve the great things that we've inherited as uh, residents of Pasadena and work on some of the things that, uh, that maybe um, we'd like to see uh, be different. Uh, and that's what I see as the challenge before us. You mentioned that you have seen the city grow in some ways that you feel some of its, or many of its residents are not happy with. Uh, I'm wondering if you might take a moment to, to uh, explain some of those issues. Well, they're the, the things that we experience on a daily basis, traffic, for example. Um, I think, you know, it's a little bit different now as we experience COVID, but uh, one of the things that I heard most that during my campaign that people don't like is the, the traffic that's impacted our city, and I think we need to address those issues. Um, there's the issue of the built infrastructure and whether we've grown uh, as a city in a way, or, 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 or overdeveloped as a city in a way that has affected our sense of place um, in a way that uh, we don't like, and, and we need to take a close look at that. But then there are also social issues. Um, there's the issue of opportunity for all. There's the issue of uh, fairness in, in policing, fairness in uh, access to resources and to programs, you know, whether it be art for children, uh, opportunities in, in, at, uh, in some of the recreation and parks uh, programs. Uh, have we priced people out, for example, uh, of our own parks and uh, recreation programs? Uh, education opportunities, those, those are all issues that uh, are very complex, but we should do all we can to address. Uh, particularly the access um, to opportunity for, for all young people, and then the issue of uh, uh, public safety and, and fair police. Well, you mentioned the, the issues of access for all and uh, also about the, the housing uh, issues. Does Pasadena face an overcrowding situation currently? Well, you know, that we'll find that out during the, uh, when we receive the numbers for the, for the most current census count, uh, we'll know much better uh, whether that's in fact the case. But there is a sense that, you know, if it's not uh, population, it's certainly uh, an overdevelopment of our built infrastructure, you know, too much density and, and too close to neighborhoods, um, too much, um, uh, or buildings that have uh, too much high uh, or too tall. Um, and, uh, you know, those are all issues that uh, we 
we can address. So it's really two different issues. One is a population issue, and uh, we'll know when we receive the next count. The other issue is um, the type of development uh, and the intensity of development and the location of development uh, in close proximity to single family residential neighborhoods. And then, you know, there's the issue of uh, affordability that, that brings on an even greater complexity to the discussion on housing. That's certainly so very true. Well, earlier we talked about your vision for Pasadena, and perhaps that is a long-term question. Uh, you've been in office for a few months now. Obviously, there's quite a bit of your term left to go. What, what, what are your top priorities right now for the city? Well, the top priority is ensuring that we continue to come through COVID, um, both uh, on the health side, uh, you know, people have to recall that COVID pre uh, presented not only a health crisis for all of us, but also presented an economic crisis um, and in many ways um, challenges involving mental health issues and education. And so my one of my top priorities is to ensure that we come through COVID. The second priority is addressing the issue of public safety, uh, not just the issue of uh, fairness in policing and uh, and trust, but also the fact that you know we've experienced an, an uptick in in um, in uh, violence in Pasadena, and ensuring that our police officers have the training uh, to uh, training and equipment and resources to address uh, the issue of violence as well. Uh, and then, of course, um, there's the issue of housing that uh, is, is very important for the reasons that we discussed, both the appropriateness of uh, the development, as well as the need to ensure that uh, that people have access to safe and, and clean housing uh, throughout our city. You mentioned the, the pandemic and the effects that it's had uh, across the country, but from a financial standpoint, how has the pandemic and the shutdowns affected Pasadena? You know, it's interesting, um, during, when the pandemic first struck, uh, we did have to shut down uh, for a few months. Um, virtually every uh, going operation had to shut down, um, except for the city, the city, city services had to continue. And so we continued to spend money. Um, and then we had the additional cost of addressing the, the uh, pandemic itself. Uh, and so we, we spent about 19, uh, million dollars in uh, pan direct pan uh, costs related to the pandemic and approximately another 10 or so million um, in indirect costs uh, related to the pandemic, a total of about $29 million, um, I would say to you, were expended that we did not anticipate um, uh, spending until the pandemic struck. And then we lost about $30 million in, in revenue uh, as the result of the pandemic. Most of it, uh, great, I should say, a great deal of it uh, is the result of uh, the transient occupancy tax, license fees, because you know people weren't applying for licenses, building permits, uh, those sort of things. Uh, and the, the transient occupancy taxes, as you know, is the hotel tax and people weren't traveling. But interestingly, uh, we saw a, a pretty stable sales tax. Uh, people continued to buy, but they were buying virtually through Amazon and they were ordering in and picking up from uh, from uh, restaurants. And so the sales tax stayed, stayed fairly stable. Uh, the property tax, um, interestingly enough, um, has stayed very stable. In other words, uh, we anticipated a lot of delinquencies uh, or people not being able to pay their property tax, but that's turned out to not be the case and people have uh, have paid. And so our, our finances are, are in, uh, relatively good shape. Uh, we've been very prudent. We, you know, slowed hiring, if not completely brought it to a standstill, uh, and took other actions to ensure that uh, we that our uh, finances were were stable uh, going forward. Okay. Well, so often uh, is the case when we have a new president, and and presidents President Biden's administration has been no exception. We often hear about the first hundred days in office and the agenda for the, those first hundred days. Is there such a thing for the mayor of Pasadena? Is there a hundred day agenda? You know, uh, it, it uh, there there is, and uh, 
and uh, I think we we we're well on our way to uh, having achieved the goals that we set out. Uh, I wouldn't say it was for the mayor uh, himself, <laughs> in, in that case me, uh, but I would say it was for our city council and our and uh, our city staff, and that was to stabilize things related to COVID. It was to ensure that we were doing all that we could to help our local businesses succeed uh, and to bring some sense of normalcy. Uh, you know, we were we were um, uh, very responsive to our local businesses, allowing them to uh, open, providing the guidelines that were needed for them to reopen quickly. We we were in a better position than virtually every other city, I would argue, uh, throughout the county. Uh, because we have our own health department, because we have our own economic development staff, and because people were working very hard to get our businesses back in, in order. When it came time to um, test and vaccinate folks, um, again, uh, you know, our goal in those, in those first 100 days was to do all that we could to, uh, to improve conditions from a health perspective, uh, from a business perspective, and ensure that the city's finances were in order. Those were the three goals, uh, and I believe that uh, that uh, we're well on our way to to achieving those. Are you satisfied with the city's pandemic response? I, you know, I I think we have to go back and and uh, assess all that we did. Um, I the first answer is yes. You know, I think you know we we've never seen anything like this pandemic, uh, and if you look at uh, what we've achieved in terms of vaccination testing and where we where we were and where we we where we've been and where uh, and where we are now i think we the city as a whole and i'm including residents in this did a terrific job um and uh you know i am pleased with it however you know i think we can always do some things better uh, and i think it's important after have after having experienced this pandemic that we go back and assess and we review you know what did we do well? And there will be a lot of things that we did well. What would we do differently? Uh, and there may be some things that we would do differently. And, and then what would we you know, change and not repeat? And there may be some of those things as well. Uh, I think it's always important to, to uh, keep um, trying to improve uh, as we go forward. How is the creation of the Police Oversight Committee progressing? Well, we've appointed three members from the uh, identified for appointment three members of the um, of the committee uh, they are uh, the representatives of the uh, community-based organizations uh, and uh, you know it didn't it wasn't without uh, uh, a little public sausage making but um, but we got through it and those appointments are made and i think we have three uh, fine individuals uh, and now we'll go about uh, appointing individual council member nominees and identifying a uh, uh, independent police auditor. And so we can anticipate that that will come forward in the next uh, few weeks, uh, probably in, in the next two to three weeks, uh, we can see that that process will be finalized. That's, that's our goal. Does the community seem involved enough in, in this process, in, in your opinion? Yeah, absolutely. I think there's, you know, um, there's a lot of interest, uh, direct interest uh, from some, um, but I think as a whole, people want to see their policing. Um, they want to see transparency and oversight, um, but, you know, they also want to ensure that we have a, uh, a police department that's responsive um, and that has the capacity to respond in, in times of need. Uh, and so I think for all of those reasons, uh, people are very interested in this issue. Well, you recently had your first State of the City address. Uh, and of course, because of the pandemic, that was a virtual address, a little different than in previous times. How was that experience for you? You know, it. Um, it I, I, I'm a people person, you know, and I always prefer to be in the same room with the people that I'm speaking with um, and, and addressing, or at least in the same space. Uh, if we can't be in, indoors, outdoors. And so it was a challenge to uh, talk to, as it is now, to talk to uh, to my laptop um, and, um, you know, try and communicate my thoughts and, and hopes for the city. Uh, but, uh, but we got through it. Uh, I did it from my living room, and I think that worked out well. Uh, people responded well to it. But I, I will say that uh, my preference and 
is to be in person. And I look forward to doing that next January. Well, again, earlier we discussed that you have lived in Pasadena the vast majority of your life. I, I'm wondering if you would share with us some of your favorite things about the city. I'm sorry, about? About the city of Pasadena. Well, you know, I, my, my, you know, one, one of the things that uh, I love about Pasadena is, you know, we're, we're small enough where the city is manageable. In other words, um, you know, people can pick up the phone and communicate with the city manager, with the mayor, or, or with their representative on the city council. Uh, but we're also large enough where we command a world stage. Uh, and I think that's very special. Uh, if you think about it, there aren't too many places, not too many cities in the world that can say that, uh, that can say that, you know, they come from a city that of 145,000 uh, that commands a world stage. You know, you go anywhere in the city, I'm sorry, in the world, and you say Pasadena, and people know what you're talking about. Um, you know, and you say, you mentioned the Rose Bowl, and, they, and they'll know the Rose Bowl. And so one of the things I love about Pasadena is is exactly that, that, you know, we're we're a small, tight-knit community. Uh, we're a complex community. Uh, we, you know, we bring all the issues of a big city, but we're still a small community, um, and uh, and we command a world stage. Uh, and I think that that's been because there have been so many people who have involved themselves and contributed to to uh, to create that that great city that we are um, for so many generations. Does Pasadena look at surrounding cities and compare itself or is it really an island that's forging its own direction you know i i don't know that we compare ourselves but uh, we certainly strive to be the best uh, that we can um you, you know I, I think pass i think other other cities i like to believe uh, look to pasadena for leadership uh, whether it's in preservation whether it's in housing whether it's how to evolve its business districts um, whether it's uh, it's for our parks programming, um, whatever it may be, I think we're a natural leader, uh, and I, I want to believe that uh, other cities look to us for for leadership and uh, to set the example in all of those areas. Well, you mentioned being a people person a little while ago, and uh, recently the city council meetings have begun to uh, open back up to actually having in person speakers rather than virtual. Um, how has that been for you? I, I, you know, it, it's it's been refreshing to actually hear people um, and uh, and have them participate in in real time. I still look forward to when I can look across the dais at uh, people as they they're speaking to us uh, and addressing us, and I look forward to welcoming my colleagues back into uh, the council chambers. Um, I think that that's the best case scenario, um, but it has been a breath of fresh air to actually hear people in real time. Well, of course, you're no stranger to being at those city council meetings prior to being the mayor of Pasadena. You were, of course, one of the, the council members. So you're no stranger to that stage. But it's it's got to be a different feeling now. Do you, do you feel as though you carry more weight now that you have the final say? Well, I, I probably do carry more weight because of COVID, uh, <laughs> not necessarily because being the mayor. Um, but, you know, I, I, there, there is a, 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 a strong sense of responsibility, I would say to you. Uh, to being the mayor uh, and i certainly feel that strong sense of responsibility uh, and again appreciate that uh, my council colleagues the staff and the residents of pasadena recognize the 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 very heavy responsibility that comes with uh, sitting in in this beautiful office uh and chairing the council meetings and and uh taking on the the title of mayor of pasadena mayor gordo it's been pointed out that you are the first generally elected mayor who actually went through the Pasadena Unified School District during your educational career. I was wondering if you could share a little bit of insight about that. You know, having attended uh, uh, Madison Elementary, Willard, uh, Wilson Junior High and Pasadena High School, and even PCC, and now uh, being able to say to those students, um, you know, I've walked these halls, uh, I played on this playground, uh, I played in the turkey tussle, uh, you know, I uh, competed uh, on the baseball diamond here, just like you did, and, and, and in some ways uh, also struggled, as many of our students are struggling, uh, in, you know, uh, including with uh, the fact that I didn't speak uh, the English language. And so I feel a great connection to our student population and young people 
because I did walk in, in their shoes. Um, I did uh, experience some of the challenges that they too experience uh, today, uh, be it uh, uh, economic challenges, um, quality of life challenges that come with being at a lower economic level, um, but also having walked the same halls as some of our students. Uh, it's, so it's a, it's a tremendous privilege to be able to say, to visit schools or go to the student uh, population um, and say to them, you know, I, I too, and a lot of it is virtual of course, but just to be able to say to them, I, I, I walked in your shoes and you too can one day be mayor of Pasadena. Um, and it does uh, uh, provide them with uh, with uh, a different insight than I think other mayors might provide who can't say that. And with that, I think we have run out of time for our interview. And I know your schedule is very busy. Mayor Gordo, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. It has truly been an honor and a pleasure and, uh, and a very insightful conversation. It's a uh, it's an honor and a privilege to to serve as mayor, and I want to thank you and your viewers for having me here today. And I want to thank the residents of Pasadena for affording me the opportunity to to serve as as their mayor. Thank you again. When we return, we'll speak with Pasadena's vice mayor. Stay with us. This is a royal lot. Joining me now is the Vice Mayor of Pasadena, Mr. Andy Wilson. How are you this evening? Good, Joe. How about you? Doing all right. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, I'd like to start off by asking if you would not mind telling our viewers at home a little bit more about yourself. Perhaps give us a little bit of your background. Sure. My pleasure. So I um, have been in Pasadena about 25 years. Um, love this place. Lived more than a dozen cities before Pasadena. So. Um, very intentionally came to Pasadena, wanted a place with strong community, great architecture, great walkability, um, and I think I hit the jackpot. Um, so uh, love the city and have been active in the community more or less since I arrived. Uh, I kind of feel like once you choose a place intentionally, you, your relationship changes and like this is my home and I want to make it better and protect it and improve it. So I've been see, very active civically. Um, day job of an entrepreneur started a number of high tech companies, ran a venture capital fund, and today I uh, run a not for profit focused on high tech job creation uh, in Southern California. So, um, also in community services, not just the mayor job, but running a not for profit organization, working on creating good jobs for people here in Southern California. Well, you certainly mentioned the the business aspect of your uh, education and training, and uh, you I don't recall you mentioning, but you're also a degreed engineer. Is that uh, that's correct? Also, Joe, I knew you were going to pump the engineer. Yeah, I studied mechanical and materials um, engineering at Dartmouth College, and um, also got my MBA in operations and technology from Harvard. Um, I should mention. Um, I have two kids as well, and um, I, I have a rescue dog who's at my feet, Gandalf. Um, so he may make a cameo and pre appearance at some point during this interview. So heads up. Well, starting with the degrees in, in business and, of course, in engineering, what? Uh, how did you make the leap to public service? Yeah, um, you know, my mom was always a, a volunteer, and I could never figure out why, except for my dad wanted to keep her busy. <laughs> Uh, but I just love the ability to, to give back. Um, and even though I was really busy, you know, building companies, I always made time to uh, be involved in not-for-profit organizations. Uh, early on, um, was a, a board member and the vice chair of the board of Pasadena Heritage and got involved with Pacific Oaks. And um, Mayor Bogard got me roped into um, design commission and planning commission. So um, I just love the city so much, and um, there's no better way to, to show that appreciation for what we have here than, than kind of volunteering and providing leadership. And I really look at my elected office as just an extension of that. I have no great you know, political ambitions. It's just uh, a way to, a different way to give back to our community. So it's, it's been a, an honor and pleasure and um, kind of makes me feel like we're, we're making a difference. And I hope my kids, honestly, you know, stay in Pasadena and hopefully some of the work I'm doing uh, will uh, keep our city to, you know, making it one of the greatest places uh, in California and maybe in the country. 
Well, you just mentioned uh, that you didn't have particular political ambitions, and that leads right into my next question. Would you say that becoming the vice mayor was the logical progression of your political career, or was this uh, quite a surprise for you? So, um, you know, running for elected office um, was a little bit of a surprise, and I think that was a lot more work. Um, if you ever run a local campaign, it's a lot of door knocking and, um, you know, distributing flyers and doing workshops and coffees and um, also thinking about what's important to the city and how you can contribute. So I think the big leap for me was um, running for office um, and um, I didn't realize it would be that much work, honestly. Uh, the, the vice mayor is kind of I'd say a little bit more ceremonial um, and it's a, a pleasure to you know back up the mayor. Maybe we could talk a little bit about what it means to be the vice mayor. Um, and I'm pleased that my colleagues have given me an opportunity to serve and provide um, a little bit more leadership on, on the city council. Well, obviously, being the vice mayor sort of makes you the second in command in the city, as it were. Um, what do, what do you see happening with the city uh, over the course of of your your tenure as the vice mayor? Um, perhaps just in the future, what? Uh, what would you like to get accomplished? Yeah, um, I mean, fortunately, we're getting kind of, I think, to the, the backside of the pandemic, and you know, there, that sucks all the oxygen out of the room. Uh, it's been such a, a overwhelming set of challenges and um, you know, use of resources, and uh, for all the obvious reasons, a massive priority in terms of what we're doing and what the city is responding to. So, um, and I'm sure that answer is probably true if you went and talked to, you know, 100 mayors and vice mayors across the state and the country. Um, good news is I think we're, um, with the vaccines rolling out, uh, I, I'm excited to um, vaccinate twice myself to start seeing some return to normalcy. Um, I know it's been incredibly difficult on uh, frontline workers and um, our restaurateurs and our retail establishments. So um, that has been kind of the priority in trying to get through that and I think will be exciting to get into the recovery mode versus the survival mode. Um, so I'm really eager to kind of get to the other side and think about painting an exciting uh, future for our community on, especially the business side has been impacted and, um, you know, think about parents with kids who have had to homeschool them. Unfortunately, my kids are a bit older, but uh, I have people on my team, my day job team who have younger kids and it's been an incredible challenge having, you know, five and seven year old doing remote school. Uh, so that has been, you know, the, the seismic challenge in front of us. I think there's always, uh, I think kind of a recurrent occurrence of, of opportunity um, that are um, kind of going on and continue to go on beyond the pandemic. Um, affordable housing is, is one of those ongoing challenges here in Southern California. Uh, we're no exception in Pasadena. Um, related to that is, you know, addressing and providing um, services to our homeless community and homeless population. Uh, and we've been spending a lot of time recently, as I'm sure you're aware, on um, establishing a citizen police oversight commission and uh, making sure that all people in the city of Pasadena feel uh, well represented and the, the, the hand of justice is treating them fairly. So, um, you know, we really pride ourselves in our diversity, but we can't take that for granted. And I think um, some of the work we're doing on our police commission and our independent auditor or uh, hopefully continue to improve the way the city operates and in particular our police department. So those are some kind of, I'd say, important issues is beyond the pandemic. Um, I'm also a walker. So I love the fact that we are, a, I call it an integrated city in the sense that we have, you know, restaurants and residential and commercial or kind of a mixed use city. We're not just kind of a bedroom community. And so you really can have a very complete life by, getting around um, our community and rather than just getting your car everywhere. Um, so for me, one of the big topics is always uh, effective mobility, right? How do we get people around um, without having to get them in cars and the use of our transit system and our um, pedestrian capability and our bike system. So those are things that are, uh, I think, important to Pasadena and add to our quality of life. Well, you took office in December of last year, 2020. So it's only been a few months, or perhaps it's been a few months. I guess it depends on your point of view. <laughs> Those are COVID months. Those are like dog months. Uh, Multiple COVID, months. That's, that, uh, 
I, I suppose that's probably very true. It's it's certainly been a unique experience over the last year. Uh, nothing is is quite the norm. But how has it been in these past few months uh, as the vice mayor? Well, you know, remember, um, just not to go back to the pandemic and <laughs> pound that into the ground, but wow, um, think about the caseloads and where we were in January and February. My goodness, you know, the wheels are coming off. And uh, we were, I think we peaked out around just about 200 cases a day. And now we're zero, one, two, maybe three. Um, so we were definitely in um, firefighting mode. Um, our hospitals were full, um, our ICUs were full. Um, we're worried about oxygen. I mean, it was really a, a battlefield. Um, and I think, you know, it's difficult with these stay at home orders because it really impacts our lives and our businesses. Um, I think that and, you know, reinstituting that and people taking masking seriously, it's, and frankly, the rollouts of the vaccines have really um, transformed the state of play in a very short time. Um, and so, uh, thinking about the future, like you got to survive as I tell people, you, you must be present to win. And if we can't get through kind of the pandemic and uh, then there's no forward planning of what our city's going to look like. So uh, knock on wood, I do think um, we have navigated our way through that. And I want to acknowledge the incredible work of our healthcare workers and our um, health department. I think Dr. Go, um, <laughs> speaking trial by fire, I recall, I think she became our health director, literally, you know, um, in the fall of, you know, was it 2019? So right before the pandemic, right? And it's like, hey, if things are, you know, pretty st status quo and, you know, trial by fire for sure. Um, so anyway, that has been a, a big uh, area of, of focus. I think also hand in hand with uh, becoming the vice mayor was a transition in, in the mayoral leadership. Uh, mayor Tornick obviously, um, you know, uh, passed the baton to uh, Mayor Gordo. Um, and they have different styles and I think use um, the council in different ways. So I think um, it was changed in the respect of not just having a vice mayor role, but also how um, Mayor Tornick kind of leads the council. Um, and I think it's, you know, I'm on a number of subcommittees. My workload as my wife can tell you at the city level has increased. Um, I've added the finance committee, which is um, really, I think, you know, balancing our budget. We have a $600 million budget and, Finance Committee is at the, the front of that. And you can imagine some of the challenging topics we're dealing with in terms of getting through uh, the financial impacts of, of the pandemic, um, you know, real impacts off also to things like the convention center and the Rose Bowl. Uh, so, you know, uh, in um, revenues associated with sales tax um, have also contracted during that period. And there's been a time like no other in terms of need to get services out to people, whether that be, you know, providing food or housing or um, supporting our small businesses. So um, I just use it as an example from the finance committee. That's been a, a lot of work. And I think um, we are expecting um, a nice kind of contribution from the feds as part of the CARES Act to alleviate some of um, the loss of our, some of our reserves. Um, so that's once again, new, new responsibility, not necessarily part of the vice mayor, um, responsibility. I also represent the city in uh, joint powers authority um, for, for Aurora Verdugo, which is a part of our transit system. Um, and I've um, stepped up to be the chair of the Municipal Services Committee. Um, those are kind of just more responsibilities. Um, and then, you know, the vice mayor backs up the mayor when he's tied up. And uh, a few times I've had to run meetings when um, he's tied up a little bit or has dropped off of a meeting for some reason. Um, so I get to try the gavel out for a test drive. Um, and the other area that, that hasn't happened frequently yet is if the mayor is, you know, double booked for ceremonial activities, whether it be, you know, ribbon cuttings or participating in panels and conferences, um, you, know, you can't be in two places at once. And he has a day job as well. Uh, I'm here to back him up. So we're, I think it's a, team effort. Um, I obviously take my cues from him, um, but um, so far so good, but the workload definitely has has gone up, probably doubled. Um, and I think that's a combination of um, becoming, you know, more senior in the council, leading uh, more committees and the, and the vice mayor piece. So it's a little bit hard to separate. A moment ago, you brought up the pandemic and it's certainly hard to avoid that topic even now. Uh, certainly, 
taking office in December of last year, you were coming in during some of the darker times of the pandemic. I, I believe, as you noted, things are are not as bad, certainly by any stretch of the imagination now, uh, than as to compared to what they were um, in in late 2020. But I, I want to ask you. Are you happy? Were you pleased with the city's response to the pandemic? Did the city, did the city's response work well? I mean, obviously they have to work with the county and they have to work with the state, but but the city has some degree of autonomy. Were you happy with with the city's response? What went well? What do you think could have been done better? Well, you know, um, this is kind of once in a hundred year type scenario, um, and you can never be as prepared as you would like. Um, I think the um, our uh, assisted living and nursing homes were um, certainly impacted uh, early on and, and quite dramatically. Um, a lot of those are those most of their regulatory oversight is with the county and the state, honestly. Um, but I wish we'd been able and equipped to do more. Um, it's not a world that we play in that much on a normal basis. So um, now we're kind of um, kind of in, in a firefight. Um, and I think our health department did all they could to, to support um, that network. And we have quite a few nursing homes and assisted living facilities. So um, I think we're, I wish we were better prepared for that, but I don't know if it would be realistic to expect that given that we're kind of not um, primarily in that work stream, right? That's not normally an area that we play in. Um, I think even though we do have our own health department, um, you know, we are subject to the state rules, right? We can't, we only can be stricter than the state. Uh, and I think, um, you know, the governor, you know, Gavin Newsom was, was pretty aggressive in terms of the rules and shutting things down. So, you know, we only could be even more strict. So, you know, I don't know that um, some people would argue that maybe we were uh, too strict in clo closing things down. Um, I don't kind of, uh, since we didn't have the latitude to do less, I don't really worry about that because it wasn't available to us. Um, so I think in terms of the space that we were given uh, to respond, um, I think we, I, I would probably give ourselves maybe a B plus. Um, I feel like, you know, we did a lot very quickly around um, providing food because a, a lot of, uh, especially children depend on our, our school system to get um, square meals on a regular basis. And uh, we um, worked closely with schools and set up um, kind of food distribution points and pushed a lot of food to food pantries. Um, and, you know, if you can't eat, you know, <laughs> not, nothing else is happening. Um, and then I think moving out in terms of supporting our small businesses and having a grant program and um, allowing outdoor dining and working very quickly to do that. Um, I think I've always been a fan of actually doing more outdoor commerce. Um, people have been a little bit cautious and you know, you know this. We're both engineers. Engineers can be cautious; they're always afraid about doing something new, and they want to be very systematic. Uh, but under the, the pandemic, I think we were forced to to be agile, um, and I think we are kind of took on some experiments that have worked out well. Um, I know I enjoy seeing the um, you know outdoor dining and call it you know Playhouse Village or South Lake or Old Pasadena. I just think it really activates um, parts of our um, commercial districts and we're in Southern California, the weather's so great. Um, it was great just to see those things happen and happen quickly. And um, I know the council is committed to uh, figuring out how to keep much of that and making it more permanent. Um, so I think that was uh, worked pretty well. Um, I've heard great things and I'm a beneficiary of our vaccine clinics. And I think we've done a good job, um, you know, distributing and doing outreach to um, make sure people in Pasadena get vaccinated. Uh, the um, vast, vast majority of our seniors are all vaccinated. And um, I think it's 70 plus percent now of, of people in Pasadena have um, at least one vaccine and 50% um, are fully vaccinated. Um, and so I think that's really, you know, the, the light at the end of the tunnel is getting people vaccinated. Um, so when I look at that, um, you know, in many ways, I think we did almost as well as we could have. Uh, it's hard to you know, prepare, be fully prepared for, you know, once in a, in a century type scenario. Um, and I want to, once again, recognize Dr. Go. I think, um, you know, she's incredibly smart and hardworking and um, there wasn't a lot of experience to fall back on because we didn't 
hadn't done this before. And I think she was relatively new to the job and probably was playing a, a little too close to the playbook, like kind of the textbook. And then you realize, you know what, it's like being in battle. Like, you know, you go to, I'm not a military person, but you probably go to training camp and you learn one thing, but then when you get in the battlefield, it's, it's quite a bit different. So you have to improvise. And I think um, when she got into that mode, I think thinking about all the impacts, uh, I think she um, stepped up and has actually um, finished strongly um, just in time, because I think we're all getting kind of impatient. And I'm just grateful that the vaccines got produced in record time and that, you know, we've all started to benefit from uh, getting the jab in our arms. So I, I know I'm eager to spend some time with some friends and get rid of my mask when I'm walking outside on the street. I certainly want to wear it when I'm in an inside area. Um, so once again, I'd say B plus, um, you know, not perfect for sure, but uh, also strong finish, right? It's kind of like, you know, you started slow in the semester, but you finished strong when we got to the final test. Um, so uh, I like to say we're going to learn from this. Hopefully we don't need to dust off this playbook again, <laughs> uh, at least in our lifetimes, if it's once in a hundred years. Um, but anyway, uh, it, it's one of those things that we will uh, reflect on, I think, in, for the rest of our lives, if we've gotten through um, this unusual you know, pandemic. Well, I think B plus is probably a very good score, and it certainly does uh, reflect the idea that there's always room for improvement, and that always makes for a better response in the future. So I think that's an excellent way of looking at things. I'd like to move on to what could possibly be considered a, a slightly more sticky wicket, and that's the situation with policing. Um, certainly, it's been in the news. We've seen a lot of issues uh, in the state, uh, in the county, across the country. More locally here in Pasadena, there have been a few issues recently, and the formation of a police oversight committee, which is still in process as we speak. I was hoping you might take a moment or two to talk about that, your thoughts and your feelings uh, about policing in the city. Um, um, to me, it, it is um, critically important that every citizen, regardless of uh, who they are, color, creed, um, feels comfortable and, and safe and um, like justice is going to treat them fairly. Um, I think our diversity of our community um, is one of its greatest strengths. And there are a lot of wonderful communities around us that aren't as diverse, but I was very intentional in selecting to live here and raise my family here. And um, I, once again, it's something I value greatly. Uh, I find it disturbing and troubling that um, certain segments of our community don't feel like our, our police department or the criminal justice system is uh, fair to them. Uh, and I, once again, that, that kind of contradicts, I think, this sense of we're all in it together. Um, so I do think um, there's clearly room uh, for improvement. Um, uh, I do think uh, Chief Perez um, is community minded. Um, I think I uh, value his leadership there. Um, and I think, honestly, he's been a, a proponent of the oversight commission as well um, in the independent auditor, because he too um, thinks we can do better. And I really respect that from someone like Chief Perez, who's been, you know, in law enforcement for 30 years and, you know, he's the chief and it's kind of like, you know, when you're the King Poobah, like maybe you think you figured it all out. Um, and I love his humility. And actually, I'd like to think I share some of that humility as well. Um, I realize like the more I learn, the more I have to learn, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And I think um, Chief Perez embraces that. So I think he's um, hopeful like I am by um, more systematically engaging voices that are, aren't um, frequently enough heard um, with respect to how our community engages with our police department will help them be better. Um, so I'm hopeful that that won't just be kind of a griping session, but really we'll figure out how to um, systematically engage and constructively guide um, and provide key feedback and input in terms of how we, we operate um, our police department. And, you know, policing is incredibly difficult. I mean, I like, it's, it's not like giving parking tickets. Um, and, you know, the police department is pulling, you know, more guns than ever off the streets. And we've had a um, unfortunate spike in gang violence and um, murders. I mean, those, that means we look to the police for that. Um, and they're faced with making a very difficult split second decisions um, and so um, 
you know, more training, you know, um, implicit bias training, um, but it's, it's not going to make the job easy. And I think we sh we owe it to ourselves and we owe it to the police department to um, give them every resource possible to make them better. And I'm, I'm hopeful that this um, oversight commission and the independent auditor will actually um, kind of deliver on the goods and, and help them to be better. I've noticed that you've used the word community a lot, and that lends to the belief that community is certainly something that's very, very important to you. And with that in mind, uh, do you think that the community in Pasadena is e involved enough in, in political affairs within the city, or are there, is there more that could be done? And if there is, how do, how do we get them involved? So, um, you know, what you find is they are aspects of our community that are, are very involved, like the advocates. Um, and I was doing an interview for, with some students who were doing their capstone project at Occidental in political science. And they're asking this question. I said, what happens is you get, um, you know, the pros and cons of people who are at either ends of the spectrum advocating very vociferously but the 80% of the community either um, doesn't care or is happy with something in the middle. Uh, and um, as I like to say, um, you know, most of the time the answer is in the middle, right? It's not all of one and all another. So inevitably the, the advocates are not happy with our work because they didn't get one or the other. We got something kind of up the middle, a hybrid. Um, so the advocates, we have a very, a lot of advocacy groups um, and they are, um, I respect all of them. I think they have, often a thoughtful and important perspective to bring. Um, but I think a little bit of the, the common person who's, you know, um, they're always surprised what's going on. 80% of the people are not super well informed. Um, so I think trying to engage, you know, um, the populace at large is um, important. I'm hopeful that um, organizations like Passion Media and our PIO um, will continue to be creative to bring um, city government and what's happening in our community uh, to their doorstep in, in ways and places where um, they live, work, and play, and where they spend their time. Um, so we always can do better. Um, I think it's important. This is their city, right? We represent them, um, not just the advocates on either end. So um, hopefully that was helpful. Well, I'm always amazed at how quickly the time goes by when I'm speaking to a public official such as yourself. And it appears we've just about run out of time, but I do have one final question for you. Is there a mayor, Andy Wilson, somewhere in Pasadena's future? <laughs> um, I, I think probably not. Um, Vice Mayor is, is, is great. Um, I've enjoyed serving the community as an elected official. Um, I imagine, frankly, I'll probably take a, a little bit of a break after my term is up. Um, so I reserve the right to you know, figure that out in the future. Um, I, I love the city, and if I think uh, you know, being mayor someday was would be a, the best and greatest use of my time and effort to serve the city, um, perhaps. But right now, that's not in, that's not in the cards. Um, I feel like you know this has been a wonderful chapter in, uh, of being a, a public servant in elected office, um, but you know nothing imminent for sure. Well, Vice Mayor of Pasadena, Mr. Andy Wilson, thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing your thoughts. We truly do appreciate it. It's been a pleasure having you here tonight. Thanks, Joe. Great chatting with you. If there are topics you would like to see addressed on our program, you can email them to us at arroyolive at pasadenamedia.org, and we may include them in a future broadcast. Until next time, this has been Arroyo Live. I'm Joe Carbonetta. Thank you for watching, and good night.